And I'm going to read to us uh, from that passage, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to 21. Uh, in order for you to remember the other passages, they're printed below that on page two. And then there's a sermon outline beneath. And we'll spend a bit of time thinking about God's word. When Jesus became aware of this, he withdrew from there. Huge crowds followed him and he healed them all. He warned them not to make him known so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul delights. I'll put my spirit on him and he'll proclaim justice to the nations. He'll not argue or shout and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He'll not break a bruised reed and he'll not put out a smouldering wick until he has led justice to victory and the nations will put their hope in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there and so you're welcome to follow along there and uh, if I move quickly without too much haste, uh, there might be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the sermon before we pray and then share in the Lord's Supper. I want to go to a great love of mine, and that's history. And I want to talk to you about a theory about history. Now, don't worry, the history lessons will stop soon. I'll run out of things to say. But the great man theory of history says this. All history can be explained by looking at the biographies of great men and great women. They're leaders who have been placed in certain positions, who heroically lead their people to greatness, who change the course of events by their sheer natural ability and charisma. There's a lot of debate around that theory, and I think it's bunkum most of the time. And you can ask questions about nature versus nurture and the nature of history. But in its purest form, it says that all of history is about the leaders and they're natural, and they're heroic. Let me tell you, theories don't work in their purest form, do they? In reality, the great man theory of history ends up explaining how history is dominated by blokes who steamroll their way through obstacles, who dominate others, who dictate those around them, who are dictators and despots who say, my way or the highway. In essence... It leads to a form of leadership that dominates and destroys and that's ultimately selfish and self-seeking. It produces a type of leadership which says, and I heard someone share this with me this week, they didn't support this view, it produces a type of leadership that says, leaders never apologise. It produces an understanding of leadership that says, it's all about me. And yet, the greatest man in history was no such leader, was he? In fact, in today's passage, he's described as the servant. And we're going to look at his biography over the next few weeks. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It's great to be able to sit here with fans and windows and sunlight and green, to open your word, to sit with others who desire to hear from you, Father, please remove distraction from our hearts and minds today. Please enliven us by your spirit. Please move us by meeting Jesus as he truly is. And please help us to represent him faithfully to the world. Amen. I'm almost tempted to scrap the next six pages in my sermon, but I've written them after the kids' talk. I'm almost tempted to scrap them, but I've written them, so you're going to listen to them. I have point two on the outline. Uh, where are we in the Bible? Uh, we're in Matthew's Gospel, his good news biography of Jesus. It's our third year in Matthew, and God willing, we'll finish it over, over the next four or five years. One of four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that kick off the New Testament. Uh, they're good news announcements. They cover the life and times of Jesus Christ and all of them, though Matthew especially, all of them have really deep roots back into the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible. As you listen to what Ash and Carly and the kids shared with us, you would have picked up that Matthew is what you call an insider-outsider. As a Jew, one of the nation of Israel, a descendant from a man called Abraham, Matthew is an insider He's part of a nation that was descended from Abraham that had received significant promises from God. Remember Genesis 12, 1 to 3? 
that through this mob, God would roll back sin and bring blessing. God would deal with the human attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. And he'd restore his creation, bringing his people, bearing his image to live with him under his word. One of Abraham's mob would not only deal with sin, but would wear that crown that we saw Matthew, also known as Elias, hold up the front. 2 Samuel 7, descended from David. But Matthew's also an outsider. He's someone who's chosen to betray his nation and back another horse. He's a Jew living in Israel at the time of Jesus who's decided that the promises of God, and I think this is what has happened in his life, the promises of God are not going to come true. The Jews are going nowhere, so I may as well throw my lot in with the Romans because I'm going to make a huge amount of money. And so he joins them as a tax collector. He's meant to collect the taxes, but then he takes his cut. And for the Jews, that was the ultimate sin, to betray your people to turn you back on God effectively. And so they push him to the outside of society. Uh, He was that. He was a sinner. Not because he was a tax collector, despite what sometimes we think, but because he was a human being. Because his attitude and action said, I want to be God instead of God. That's all of our fundamental problem. We're all with Matthew. We're all outsiders, aren't we? We're all outsiders. We're outside God. We want God's job. We want God's throne. The Bible calls that sin, but it's broken us, hasn't it? It's broken our world. It's brought God's judgment. And God has said, I'm going to deal with it. And this bloke, an insider, outsider, meets Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. It changes everything. Jesus came to restore people like Matthew, people like us, outsiders. Sinners. And he chose to do that regardless of their background, regardless of their education, regardless of their history, their skin colour or their place in society. Jesus said, I've come to deal with humans. And when that happened, when that happened, Matthew realised that the promises given to the insiders were to restore all the outsiders for every outsider that trusted in them. Remember how, as we were reminded in the kids' talk, that genealogy kicks off, Matthew, that opening verse, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and then it goes through a list of people, and you look at Jesus' family tree and go, well, mine's a lot better than that one. Because there's all these sinners in Jesus' family tree. And Matthew's saying, the promises made to the insiders have been brought so that the outsiders can be returned to God. Now, the last time we spent time with Matthew, Jesus had just been revealed as the one to bring rest. What was the, what was the picture for that in the kids' talk, to bring rest? It was a pillow. It wasn't good. You're still awake. It's great. A pillow. Jesus had come, I'm at point three on the outline, to restore humans to what God designed them to be to be living with God, to be at rest, not restless, not working so much that their influence is felt, but to be restored to God. And as Jesus spoke that, this was the reaction. Verse 14, the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now the word destroy there isn't kill him. The word destroy there is effectively, I want to wipe every molecule of this man from existence. I want to wipe every molecule of this man from existence because he is breaking the law. He's doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh, In essence, he was actually exposing these leaders, exposing how they'd perverted what God had given them. Maybe we need reminding. Remember that reading we had from Roz, Exodus 19, God's people saved? God's people have been given a job, taken out of Egypt. God brings them to that man. He says, you're my mob. I've got a job for you. Your job is to represent me to the world. And then he shows them how to do it, doesn't he? He gives them the Ten Commandments. Got to get that order straight, don't we? The Ten Commandments come when? After they're saved. So they know how to represent God to the world. 
how they can live in a way that reflects the nature of God. Those men, though, and they were men, those religious leaders, those men have been sucked in by the great man idea. The law's not about God, it's about them. History's not about God, it's about them. Their job is not about God, it's about representing them. And so they take the law and they use it to show how great they are, how good enough they are to earn God's approval. And Jesus reminds them that the law is about God and representing him to the world. These are the men who want to wipe him out, take every molecule of his existence and destroy it. Well, look at verse 15. When Jesus became aware of this, he withdrew from there. Huge crowds followed him and he healed them all. He warned them not to make him known. Jesus is aware of what's being planned. So he withdraws from there. That's not secret, is it? Because all the large crowds follow him. Jesus could have been far more secretive. And there are many needy amongst those crowds and he heals how many of them? All of them. That doesn't say everyone in the crowd is sick in that way, but all of them who were sick he deals with. He shows that he's still on about restoring these people, about giving them restoration. You can't avoid the contrast with the religious leaders, can you? They want to wipe out every molecule of the man promised by God and he wants to repair every molecule of every man in front of him. What a contrast. Which one do you think is representing God? They seek to destroy, he delivers. They want to remove people, he restores them. They seek to project their power and influence and dominance, he seeks to keep a low profile. Warning the crowd not to proclaim his actions. What a contrast with the great man behaviour. And we've got an explanation. Did you see it down there in verse 17? I'm at point five on the outline, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul delights. I'll put my spirit on him and he'll proclaim justice to the nations. He'll not argue or shout and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He'll not break a bruised reed. He'll not put out a smouldering wick until he has led justice to victory. The nations will put their hope in his name. Jesus' withdrawal, Jesus' command to silence and his practice of restoring people is all about fulfilment, isn't it? Jesus has come as part of God's plan to deal with human brokenness, all connected to fulfilment, doing what God had said would happen. God did that through people. We're given their name there, aren't we? There in verse 17, prophets. Men and women who come as God's speakers. The one named here is Isaiah, and Roz was really helpful, wasn't she? Helping us see Exodus, a thousand of years, there's Isaiah, and similar amount of time frame to Jesus. Isaiah was sent to call God's people back to their job, saying, you, got, you are not representing God. You've rebelled against God. God's going to deal with you, but you've got come back. And as God says through Isaiah that he will deal with his people, he says, I'm going to save a small remnant through judgment, salvation through judgment, and I will deal with the root cause of their brokenness. At the centre of that is this person called the servant. He just appears a number of times in Isaiah. And this, the passage that Matthew talks about, is the first servant song because God's people, they ultimately fail again. They need God himself to step in and he does so through sending this servant, this mysterious figure that appears who will be everything humans should have been, everything God's people should have been. He'll be faithful to God as his representative so that he can restore people by doing what? By taking their judgment. And Matthew, did you notice what Matthew says there in verse 17 and verse 18? This bloke, Jesus, is that person, the servant. This bloke, Jesus, is that person, the servant. What what does that mean? 
Well, just work through these verses very quickly with me. In verse 18, the servant is chosen by God, hand-picked to be the one to deal with our brokenness. If you're listening carefully to Roz as she read Isaiah 42, especially in verse 6, the servant is directed by God, God directed, working to God's plan, God's schemes, God's desires. If you look there in verse 18 again, the servant is God empowered and God representing. He has the very spirit of God in him and on him. In verse 18, he's God proclaiming, speaking both the judgment of God on the world and the restoration of God, the justice into a broken world. Look there in verse 19 and 20. He's everything that the great men are not. He's not a demagogue holding himself up and making sure he tweets at 2 a.m. in the morning arguing with those who oppose him. He doesn't verbally abuse and loudly debate. He's not a despot who tramples over those who are smaller than him or weaker than him or more broken than him. He's not a destroyer who demolishes those who are not like him or who are broken and damaged. In verses 20 to 21, The servant is the vehicle for a God-restored world, bringing God's judgment and justice to which people? To the nations, to the whole world which is in desperate need. Now let me tell you, if you hold a great man theory of history, then Jesus doesn't fit, does he? He's not a man who bends the world to his will. He's not a man who demolishes obstacles because he wants to dictate and be a despot. He's not a man who makes sure that his name is in bright lights or that his PR is really smooth. He's not a demagogue who argues his way to power. Jesus is none of those things. How's he described? Well, let me tell you, it's not a job description I put on my CV, is it? I am the servant. I serve the plans and will and promise of God. I do this by serving the enemies of God, by dealing with the enemy's needs, by dealing with the brokenness of the opponents of my father. I will do that at the expense of my own legitimate claims. And ironically, that means he's the greatest man. Even though the world would not call him a great man. And his efforts are for all the nations. That judgment will be served and justice will be delivered. Remember last week and the week before where he came to die for those who had rejected him. I'm at the last point on the outline. Our world and our history is littered with figures of great men and women, isn't it? They're the men and women of such unstoppable personality and dominance that they bend history to their image. They do that through power, argument, words, manipulation, but ultimately they sink into selfishness and ego, and uh, don't expect me to apologise. History for these men and women is all about them and their legacy, isn't it? In essence, I think they have become people to whom the world says, go ahead and express your own godness in your way. The Pharisees are like that, aren't they? They express their godness in their way, actually taking the rules that were given to them to represent God and making it about them, perverting the very thing that they were given to use to represent God. The problem with that is that I like to express my godness. I like to be a great man. Ah, sure, it's a pretty little lunchbox and sandpit. But I want to be a great man. Jesus is not like that, is he? He's the servant. His timing is not his, but that of God's. 
His method is not his, but it reflects the nature of God. Not domination, it's deliverance. Not self-centered, but gentle and kind. Not argumentative and loud, but consistent and persuasive and transparent. Not destructive, but restorative. Taking the bruised and the wounded and the smoking and making them what God designed them to be. Dealing with their sin. It's a message of hope and of justice and judgment rightly achieved. It's that our deepest issue will be dealt with. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. And he did it. He did it by standing in for us at our judgment. Jesus' concern is that of God, isn't it? For all people, for the nations that here is hope for anyone made in the image of God to be offered to all that you can be restored. We still live in a great man phase of history, don't we? What a contrast. Not just to the Pharisees, not just to us, but to the world we live in. What a leader. The servant. But let me tell you, I want to share with you a question that confronted me as I thought about that this week, and I'll finish with this question. Because we are the people of the servant, aren't we? We've benefited from the servant, haven't we? We've been restored by the servant. So this was the question that I was asked this week in this passage. Do I, as a person of the servant, do we as the people of the servant, reflect him faithfully to the world. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Oh, we, we've covered so many threads today, uh, from Genesis to Exodus to 2 Samuel, uh, right through to Isaiah and other parts of Matthew. But Father, really all those threads weave such a magnificent tapestry showing us the servant the one you promised to deal with our brokenness and restore us to wholeness. Father, thank you uh, that he has done that. Father, help us to reflect that. In Jesus' name, amen.